Welcome to Chicks Who Fly, a podcast dedicated to women pilots and women in aviation. My name is Anaya and I am your host. I am a vocalist, a DJ, and a producer, and I'm also a student pilot. I am currently working on my private pilot certificate, and while I am getting some finances in place to finish my training, I have decided to stay active in the aviation community by starting this podcast, among other things. I plan to interview and feature different women pilots and women in aviation and bring those interviews to you and hopefully you guys enjoy the interviews as much as I enjoy spending time with these amazing ladies. In today's episode of Chicks Who Fly, I get to have a conversation with Tamara Griffith. Tamara's certificates and ratings include her multi-engine airline transport pilot, commercial single engine for both land and seaplane, certified flight instructor, certified instrument flight instructor, multi-engine instructor, ground instructor, and instrument ground instructor, as well as her A&P and her inspection authorization. Tamara is the daughter of Mary Latimer and her husband Lawrence, who founded and run Gift Academy which stands for Girls in Flight Training, and whose goal is to identify and to address the various issues that may be causing women to abandon flight training and to assist them in earning their pilot certificates. Tamara has been a freight pilot, a corporate pilot, and a mechanic chief inspector, among other things, and she serves as one of the head flight instructors for Gift Academy, which was also presented with an AOPA Honor Roll Award for Excellence in Training in 2013. In this episode, Tamara and I get to talk about the support, community, and camaraderie that is a part of the Gift Academy flight training experience. We also talk about flying in different countries such as Dubai, Turkey, Italy, and Mexico, and the attitudes towards women pilots in each culture. We talk about flying for different charity and relief organizations, flying with her dog and how he reacted when she had an in-flight emergency, flying with her family and what it was like having an emergency during a flight with them, and how flight training can help with other jobs and life situations. This was a really enjoyable conversation full of great insight, experience, and advice for anyone interested in or in the process of flight training. You can reach Tamara by email at giftacademyinc at gmail.com. You can also visit the Gift Academy website at girlsinflight.org. And you can find Gift Academy both on Facebook and Instagram. If you are enjoying this podcast, please consider following us on Spotify and subscribing on YouTube. It really helps us get the podcast out to more and more people. If you'd really like to be a more intimate part of the whole process of creating this podcast, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon, where our page is called Chicks Who Fly. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do that at chickswhoflyofficial at gmail.com. And please also feel free to visit our website and connect with us there at chickswhofly.com. Hi, I'm so excited that you could make it, uh, make this call and be on the podcast. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. So I start the podcast always asking people, how did you get into aviation? Why aviation for you? Uh, in my case, I was practically born into it. Both my parents are pilots, flight instructors, uh, corporate pilots. My mother's retired air traffic controller. They're both mechanics. I lived on an airport. Uh, yeah, I didn't know any better. 
So awesome. <laughs> she didn't know any better. I wish I had it known any better. So how did you start taking your first flight lessons and stuff like that? I guess the official flight lessons when they started logging them uh, was around about 15. I do know of a few where my dad was giving me some instructions early on, um, you know, tw as young as 12, but I couldn't even reach the controls most of the time uh, until about 15 when they finally I was tall enough for the cushions. Um, I knew I was talking on the radio and could write fly by instruments even as young as four and five years old. So. Holy poo. <laughs> that's that's very, very young and you're already communicating on the radios, which is obviously a big part of flying. So that's pretty cool that it was always in your plan. I didn't say I was any good at talking on the radio, but <laughs> Hey, but not being intimidated is an important part of it. Yeah, when you're when you're four, you're not intimidated. It's when you become 14, 15, you start becoming intimidated because you realize everybody's listening. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so, so you were flying since you were that little. What kind of flying did you do? I rode along on some of the corporate flights. My dad was a corporate pilot most time. Uh, while mom was an air traffic controller, she picked up some of the flights. I was also often in the back seat. Uh, whenever my dad would be instructing somebody uh, just because that was the babysitter who was the easiest place to put me. So it was a little bit of some personal travel. We would fly around, go visit a friend that had a, a dirt runway and a swimming pool, so we'd go swim at their house, things like that. Uh, you know, I, I flew in airplanes like people driving cars. I, I really thought everybody had an airplane. Coming around about 10, I started realizing I was the weird one in the town. <laughs> You know what? I heard that before from Jill. I'm trying to remember what her married name is, but, you know, her, her father built the Voyager. Right. Uh, Ruton. Uh, yes. That's so, the dad and uncle. Yes, her. Yeah. She came and spoke at the – she gave us a, a little chat at the Los Angeles chapter of the 99s once, and she was talking about how – she thought everybody built airplanes in their living rooms and garages. <laughs> so yeah, I guess you're part of that family. Yeah, we're part of that kind of a weird tribe, you know, because it's what you're surrounded with, you know, like some people thought there was cars or motorcycles. Well, I Airplanes was my surroundings. Uh, you know, I had some of the normal stuff, catching turtles and digging worms and doing all that stuff too, but it was all at the airport usually. Pretty cool. I grew up in Puerto Rico, so it was hermit crabs on the beach for me that I was digging up. So when when did you finally decide to get your pilot certificate? And in some ways, I didn't kind of have the choice. Uh, it was kind of like, this is what you're going to do. Uh, at least that's what it felt like to the teenager in me. I didn't dislike getting the private. By the time I was getting into my commercial ratings and the instructor ratings, it was starting to feel a little forced. Uh, you know, I was a teenager, kind of rebellion, kind of wanted to be normal. That's what I thought was a normal teenager. Kind of wanted to be like all the other kids, actually. You know, so flying was definitely setting me apart. I don't regret that, obviously, at this point. And, you know, when I finally got my lessons, when I got through having my children, I went back to flying. I took about five years off. That's when I kind of said, this is what I need to do. Uh, about the only thing I knew how to do. <laughs> so there was that. <laughs> yeah, I understand. This is new. What I always know how to do uh, doesn't leave me in a good position anymore. I don't. I'm, I'm ready to move on to the next thing, but that means having to suck at something new just because I'm interested in it and kind of swallow my pride and and everything yeah. else. Who taught you? Uh, mostly my dad actually did most of my actual training uh, initially, and then uh, we had another lady that became kind of a best friend of the family. She did a lot of my training. They trained her, so I was kind of like her first student that she got to practice on. <laughs> and then <laughs> we actually, when we didn't have the aircraft uh, or the equipment required for certain check rides, they sent me to a school up in Norman, Oklahoma at the time where I would finish my ratings there. 
Uh, and then I did my multi-engine here in the Metroplex uh, at one time. So, and that was, you know, a long time ago. So, yeah, that's been about 30 years now. So, I know when I talk to pilots that have more experience, I, I know I'm asking you guys to go a few years back in the Rolodex. So I do apologize <laughs> for the brain exercise. <laughs> I get to pull it out of the hat a lot. What was it like learning to fly from your dad? Was he pretty patient? He could be quite patient in the airplane. Uh, there were times sometimes when he just, you know, looked at me and said, you just really asked me that dumb question, you know. There were times that I, I think we probably laughed more in the plane. He's a lot more patient than he was on the ground doing anything. Um, can't explain that one, but I have a feeling some of that rubbed off on me. I struggled learning under my mother's thumb, and, that, you know, we partly we just butted heads. We, I don't know if we're too much alike or whatever, because they sent me off elsewhere where I learned what kind of instructors I liked and didn't like. And still, the ones I liked had to be a little bit like my dad, a little gruff on the outside, but they're total teddy bears. <laughs> but you really get down to it. <laughs> I, I think I like people like that, too. I always explain I was originally a professional dancer, so I'm used to people just being very direct and not coddling me. but you learn, you know, at a very high level, and that's important when you're flying. So I should have asked you this at the beginning. What ratings and certificates do you have currently? Uh, I am an ATP, multi-engine ATP, so that means I've got the private commercial and instrument, all that. Um, I also have the commercial single engine, land, and seaplane as well as my CFI, CFII, as we call it, and the MEI. I also have both my ground instructors, the advanced ground instructor and the instrument ground instructor, as well as I have the A&P, Air Freeman Pilot Pilot, along with the inspection authorization. And wow. Thank <laughs> what was your favorite and what was your most challenging of the certificates and ratings? Uh, the most challenging... I would have said the, the you know it would have bounced between the instrument and the CFI initial being the most challenging. The CFI is always a tough one. The very first CFI, um, mine was with the feds back then, where it was pretty much a 99 percent first time fail rate. It was a guarantee. Uh, so going in knowing you're probably going to walk away disappointed. But it turned into a good experience actually. The for my oral did uh, the, the, that part. Uh, in this case, but overall, yeah, it, my plane didn't pass the first time, and then I didn't pass the second time, but that's either here or there. <laughs> uh, but those were the tough ones. My favorite to do, though, is actually being a multi-engine instructor. Oh, cool. What's 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 the best thing about that? It, it's an advanced-type training, so it's usually a quick and dirty kind of add-on rating. Most people, they already have all their commercial single-engine stuff. They actually have some experience. I'm not really teaching them the basics of flying, but I am teaching them in a more advanced system as well, a skill set, but I'm able to take them from they've never done a twin-engine airplane, and then probably between five and eight hours, they're check, they're check ride proficient. They're ready for the check ride, and, they're you know, they're usually blown away, and that's the cool part is seeing their, you know, as they realize how quickly they're adapting to this new airplane to a new speed, you know, and knowing that they really are finally – making that big step going somewhere else. So it's a new confidence level, I think. That really does sound very cool. I can't wait for that time to come for me. I'm 22 and a half hours in, and I haven't flown in months. So I've had a, a little challenge with the – I don't want to fly again until I'm not ready to fly three times a week and do my check ride, you know, because otherwise it's extra – expense for for no reason so i i want to get in there and just really focus yeah that's exactly what i always tell my students is try to fly two to three times a week and if you got to save the money up better to save the money put off the flying until you have it all ready to do the majority of it and then go from there because too many try they spin their wheels just trying to do it whenever they can get money and you'll not not progress very well right yeah, and and I don't want to keep starting over or, or kind of staying stuck because then also my confidence takes a hit. Yes, uh, yeah, it does bring you down because you feel like you just 
you, you know, a lot of women would say, or even the men, like, I don't feel like I can do this. Um, we're getting too old. I was like, that's not the case. You got to both chair fly when you're not flying and got to keep your head in the game. And then you just got to be consistent. That's even true of me today. If I don't fly a certain airplane consistently, yeah, the first few landings are a little rough. I get that. So, so what are you currently doing uh, with aviation? I currently have a flight school of my own. Um, I've been a freight pilot. I have been a corporate pilot. I have worked as a mechanic and a chief inspector uh, in those areas. Um, but right now, the last seven years now, we've had a, a flight school started kind of accidentally. You know, one or two students, you know, it, I was while I was looking for contract work, and next thing you know, more students kept showing up, and then we buy another airplane, more students showed up. I was up to five airplanes at one point, and I was a little overwhelmed. That sounds really cool, though. The best stuff happens by accident, I think. It just kind of falls into place. Yeah, I tried to stay away from instructing for the longest time. I'd gotten a little burnt out at the age of 19, 20 years old doing it, uh, so I avoided it, but it kind of kept you know, have some things, you know, the universe keeps, you know, hitting you in the back of the head. You will pay attention. Well, yeah, that's what it kept doing until I finally paid attention and started teaching full time. That makes sense. So from the time that you started studying, did you do all your ratings in a row? And then after that, what was your first job and how did you get that? We really did do the uh, the ratings kind of in the normal order of the private pilot single and then I, you know, did some tailwheel long before they require the endorsement. Um, then we got the instrument, and then they sent me back for the commercial. You know, a little bit little later, Dad set me up for the multi-engine rating. And then a little bit later, I went back to the school for the flight instructor, and then it was a quick add-on for the other two ratings as they came available with the airplanes, uh, designees, things like this happened kind of, it kind of just happened. So, and then my... Uh, airframe and power plant uh, was brought in on that one, you know, somewhere in the middle of all that. It was all happening at the same time. So really my instructors and my A&P happened within a, within the same time frame of between 18 and 20 years old. Um, my first aviation job outside of my family, working with my family in the corporate business, was actually an A&P job. It was, a, it was being a mechanic. But my First outside flying job was flying for an, as an instructor for a short time, and then I got a picked up a corporate job uh, once my kids were, yeah, they were, you know, preteen, and then I went overseas for a while. I'd pick up little odd jobs here and there, but the first real job was actually a mechanics job. Do, do you feel that being an A and P makes you a safer pilot? I would say that most times, but, you know, after Christmas Eve, sometimes it's a distracting point in my life, too, because, you know, I can't fix it and fly it at the same time. The, <laughs> But it does give me that knowledge of, okay, the airplane is showing some symptoms. You know, how far can I take it on this symptom or, you know, what is it? You know, so it may give me some clue of what I'm dealing with. And if I right. can continue on a little ways or do I need to, you know, this is going to be a really serious issue. But because it also kind of causes me to go into diagnosis mode, so you start thinking about what the problem is, you got to you got to turn that side off once in a while going, nope, focus, fly the airplane, don't think about it, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not really usually that hard, but uh, occasionally it creeps up because I part of me wants to know what's going on and why did it do that. But, yeah, it really can. You know, and sometimes it's knowing, you know, it's like, okay, can I fly this plane? Some people are like, oh, that would scare me to not have tread on my tire. Well, I actually understand how much rubber is still left on the tire. How much longer do I think I can fly with this tire? Where most people would say, I need to change right away. Does that make sense? Uh, Perfect. You know, so, yeah, I can get a little more life out of my parts that somebody else might not sometimes. Right, and that could be an advantage for sure. Did you have any moments during your training where you scared yourself? Oh, oh yeah, I've been scaring myself, I think, daily some days, especially when I drive a car. Um, <laughs> no, no. Um, in the training, yeah, I probably did some things, you know, and I didn't think about it much back then. But also what my parent, my dad especially did is he would put me in things, you know, and show me things 
because he knew very well, like a lot of pilots, especially teenagers, we would be likely to do something we shouldn't do. So here's how to do it, and here's how to get out of it if you find yourself doing this. Um, yeah, I scared myself a few times. It was usually, you know, find myself landing downwind when I, you know, either didn't check or improperly checked the wind sock or something back when we didn't have ASOSs and AWOSs at every airport. Uh, you know, there was a few crosswind landings. It's like I wasn't sure I was going to pull that off. <laughs> oh we get dust up here in Texas, so you know. So a couple of those got me once or twice. Uh, I live in the, the DSW Metroplex now. I kind of grew up on the edge of West Texas, which is just west of Wichita Falls uh, in a little town called Vernon. Uh, so wind blows out there. There's really no trees. There's no mountains. There's no hills. A lot of dust devils occur. So and you don't see them coming on the runway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've driven across the country four times, and three of those times I've crossed Texas. Only once I was like, let me see something besides Texas, and I went up to, like, Oklahoma. And from I did Miami to Los Angeles four times, so believe me. I've seen some of those long desert roads in Texas, and I, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, I've flown coast to coast, but <laughs> I've not driven the coast to coast. <laughs> well, that's much cooler, so you win. <laughs> yeah, well, I get bored in the car too. <laughs> I always say I get lo- I get lost on the ground. You put me in the plane and I'm fine, but I get lost on the ground. I can't see where I'm going. Hey, yeah, I think I need to come and join your school for a little bit. I, I want you to rub <laughs> off on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could definitely do that. <laughs> Uh, what kind of airplanes do you have in your school right now? Uh, currently, we have two Cessna 152s and an Aztec for the multi-engine training. Um, my, one of the 152s is in the shop. There's a bulk or IFR trainers with WASP GPSs, ADB, of course. And the Aztec, again, she has the same GPS, so they're kind of all equipped. We had a couple other airplanes. One of them we've taken off the flight line. The other one we sold. Uh, she would just wore the poor plane out. Um, but, yeah, start them small, and then we take them big. Would you recommend a, a student, because what I'm thinking of doing, I'd really like to do is buy an airplane to train in, something that's IFR rated so that I can at least go through private instrument and commercial on it. Um, is that something that you would recommend? Consider it, um, especially if they, you know, looking at more than one family member possibly, you know, going to also pursue, you know, some flight training or stuff. It's not, it's not the worst idea. And if you buy right and, and the right trainer in this case, where you can still take people on, yeah, you could save yourself a lot of money because that airplane will still be worth quite a bit when you sell it. So. If you buy it right, you can sell it at the right price. And if you don't buy it at the right price, then, you know, you kind of put yourself in a little bit of a hole, depending on what the market's like. Um, but, yeah, I, I've done actually spreadsheets where we've compared paying full price for, you know, an expensive school. You pay at my school. And then if you bought your own airplane, what that price would be. Your only problem sometimes with your own airplane is making sure you have the instructors uh, you know, flow for your plane because some of the schools won't take you because they want you to use their airplanes or they're going to charge you a whole lot more, but it might be still financially viable to do it if that's where your instructor is. That's probably the only thing I've ever seen where somebody's like, they struggle to get that instructor, but there's plenty of us independents out there. How important would you say that the chemistry between instructor and student is for the training process? Especially at the private level, I think it's very important is to get the right feel, you know, and if you're not, you're not able to comfortably because you're in close quarters, to some extent your instructor has got to recognize when maybe your personal life is creeping into your training, you know, you're stressed at work, you're stressed at a home life, a situation's occurred, you know, and I need to, you know, I need to recognize, hey, you're not flying your normal self, you're, you know, you're stumbling where you weren't stumbling before. So sometimes we catch on to these things. At the same time, if you've got somebody who doesn't talk but you need that information, that's not going to 
bode well for your flight training if you can't feel like you can get information out of them or someone who just won't shut up you think that's me uh, <laughs> I just you know, that I warn people but I try to tailor my you know my style to some extent to for that person and at the same time I do have students where I realize I'm just not meshing well I'm not a very good fit for them so I do try to pair them up with an instructor that is more in line with how that person thinks and learns so they get the best of what they need. They may still fly with me, but maybe they're getting the ground school with somebody else where I'm, they fill in those blanks that I'm not filling in. That's a good instructor, in my opinion. Agreed. I've had a bunch of queries <laughs> while I've been looking for for the right situation. The combination is location and price right. and um, me having the funds and the time at, at that moment. I've, I've had a couple of situations where I've had instructors who don't talk to me enough. Like, I almost want to hear you narrating what I'm doing as I'm doing it and what should be next until I don't need your voice. <laughs> And that's actually a little bit of how I do teach my initial students like you. It's like, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk a lot. You're going to hear my voice. It's going to drone on at some point, but it's like it's on repeat. A lot of the same things. I'm repeating what's going on, repeating what's going on. And each time you're like a little sponge. Every swipe you get just a little bit more, a little bit more information. Into and when I start going quiet, it's usually because now I'm watching you apply that knowledge that you've been slowly you know, catching on to, and then if I get, when I get to the quiet point, that usually means you're doing the job, you don't need me anymore, then you'll usually solo, and then I go back to talking again, because now I'm going into distraction mode, we have to teach you how to fly with distracting passengers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's an important part, not bending over to pick up a pencil and then getting spatially disoriented or whatever as well. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of methods of doing the same thing, but yeah, I'm known as a talker. I got a few students that's like, okay, they want built, and but I am the first to tell them, says, look, if I'm distracting you, you gotta be, you gotta have the wherewithal to tell me as a pilot in command to say, hey, I need you to be quiet. Okay, if they can tell me that, then that's a big step. And actually, I learned that in my private pilot days with our the other lady that I was telling you about. Paula, when she started her teaching me, she talked too much, but she also wouldn't let me make a mistake, really. She wouldn't let me get catch the mistake myself. She had to catch it for me, and, I, and my dad was always the type, he'll let you, how far you go before you finally say, hey, you're going to do something about this wing, you know, this, you know, turning, you know, something like that, you know, and he's still like that to some extent, and I teach the same way, but Paula was in her, I was her first student, you understand. She would like, you know, hey, you're getting 50 feet off. I haven't even noticed that yet. <laughs> My scan's not there. And I finally told her to shut up one day. <laughs> and, How'd that go over? It probably fell over like a brick that day, but she did be, she was quiet for the rest of that flight. And, you know, and it really wasn't that bad. But every student she had afterward that I have talked to that became pilots, obviously, they uh, they all remember her tapping her fingernail at the instru the offending instrument that was, you know, not on, you know, where they, were, they weren't on the heading or they weren't on the altitude, and she would just point to it. She didn't talk. And I was like, oh, that would be my fault. <laughs> I created that one. Actually, that's a really effective technique, though. Like, if you're pointing at the altimeter because I'm losing um, altitude, uh, I, I think that would get my attention. So I haven't had that happen in that way, but I think that would be good. Do you have a, a favorite moment that you can remember, one in your training and one in your flying jobs? Oh, good grief. That's, there could be a whole lot of those. The funniest story is play my solo. My, first, my when I did my first solo, four six one five Zulu. It was a a Piper Colt. My dad had sold me on runway one six in Vernon. Uh, you never forget your solo. But my dad gets out, and I really wasn't nervous or anything. He, you know, I you know I've been in an airplane all my life, so it was no big. It, to me, it wasn't as big of a deal as it is for that for, for a lot of people. But I took off and I come back and I land and I taxi back and take him up because he's just standing on the side of the runway out in the middle. You know, we're in the country. We can get away with that stuff. And the first thing he does, he opens the door because there's only the one door and he grabs the sectional 
that happened to be sitting in that airplane and starts hitting me, you know, swatting me with this sectional, you know, folded sectional. And I'm like, what, what? And he goes, you didn't give me anything to complain about. You were too perfect. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> damned, if I, damned if I don't. So that was, you know, that was my first solo. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, oh, that went well. Uh, some of my favorite when I – I think my favorite was flying freight, actually, because I flew with my dog. Uh, so he got more attention than I did most days, but I enjoyed the airplane, uh, the airplane itself and what it could do uh, with the crosswinds and stuff. This airplane, the Aero Commander 500, to me, was just phenomenal crosswind airplane, and I'm from West Texas. The wind's always blowing, and it's always a crosswind, so that's all I knew how to do. <laughs> what so, kind of you know, dog do you have? He he was a border collie. He passed away here a couple of years back now. Mm-hmm. But uh he uh yeah, he was I picked him up out of a shelter. He was the he act he didn't act like a border collie until I held up the tennis ball otherwise he, he was a year old and he acted like a he acted like a twelve year old dog. Uh but he, he had to sit in the co pilot seat with me. He would not sit in the cargo you know, any place like that. You know, so he was a bit of a weird dog. <laughs> but so he was my little co pilot. Would um would you strap him in at all, or, or he was just well behaved? He was very well behaved. Actually, the first time I took him out, we just went and ta- you know I started the engines. He got over that noise and the vibration, and then I took him out for tack. We did a couple of taxis with the air, the airplane. I was doing maintenance runs at the time anyway, so it kind of worked out. Um, you know, it, uh, you know it was being paid for in a sense, and then. Finally said, okay, I got to take you with my flight. No, I didn't ever strap him in. Um, they didn't really have good harnesses in. This has been 10 years now. But he did have the little earmuff for our dog. I did buy him a set of those. Aww. The first time we started rotating off the runway, you know, he started to get antsy. And I remember just taking my hand and shoving him back into the seat. And after that, he knew exactly when we were running up. And he knew the difference between run up and take off. Because he would sit up and watch the run up, but as soon as I rolled out on the runway, he would lay down, and he would lay down for the entire flight, and then he would get back up on a, on the final approach for landing. So it's kind of like you know, raise your tray, you know, seat backs. Well, that was him. He would get up. The only time he didn't do that was when I had an actual emergency, and he didn't get out of his seat. He didn't sit up until we were secure on the runway. So he was a fairly smart little dog. <laughs> He was an aviator dog. That's so I want one. <laughs> what emergency did you have when you had him with you in the plane? I had uh, three different engine failures when I had him in the plane. Two of them were more precautionary. Uh, I had symptoms and says I need to shut it down. But they were really non-event. I had the one, which is to this day still my scariest event, uh, the engine started failing in cruise at about five, 6,000 feet. I can't tell you that it was around this time of the year. It was around December, uh, going into Austin, Texas. And the right engine started running really rough. And then I had to shut it down because it was a fix to shut itself down. Uh, there's systems reasons for doing that or it would make things worse. I finally shut it down. And unusually, this airplane normally flies well on one engine. That day it did not, and at the same time, I'm shutting this engine down and declaring my emergencies, which had already led them up that I was having problems, um, you know, went into full emergency mode. I said, I can't maintain altitude. That had never happened before uh, in any of my other situations with the same airplane. So, I, you know, and the airport was what we call zero, zero visibility. It's basically fog. You weren't seeing the ground. And I, you know, I don't have a choice. i got to land. <laughs> I just didn't think I was going to make an airport that day. Uh, all the calculations said, you know, the way I was coming down, I was going to land short of the airport. And, and in this case, I actually, towards the pattern altitude, I finally was able to maintain altitude enough to make the runway. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, <laughs> you know, everything worked out. But it was the scariest time because I truly understood that, that I, you know, I might likely die on this flight. Uh, even if I'm doing everything I can, I, if I wouldn't make an airport, it looked like I was going to hit the parking lot. Well, the parking lot has poles and cars. 
maybe the dog survived. I don't know. That was my thought process. You know, if I was out, you know, if I got off to the right of course on the going for the runway, I'd hit the hotel. Well, that's not an option. The other side was trees, not really an option. Stay center. Stay on that center of the approach towards the runway, strictly instruments, and guessing where that runway was. <laughs> right, because that's scary enough when you're able to see what's happening, but you're in clouds and fog. That's right. definitely extra nerve-wracking. Right, knowing that I might not see when to flare when to level out, uh, and I actually did not ever really see the ground. A little bit of the ground problem with seeing lights and the runway stuff is it might have been I was a little too hyper-focused, um, kind of a tunnel vision, but I never did see those runway lights. Uh, and it actually was hard to find the taxiway off once I did land on the ground. My biggest fear was ever actually coming out of the clouds, you know, when I, you know, below the clouds not knowing exactly what I was going to see. Um, when I knew where I was, that was fine, but coming out unexpectedly or having to come down below the clouds, to me, it just it signaled a problem, uh, you know, that you don't know what's really there, even though you think you do, you know, new tower that you didn't see, you know, but, uh, you know, so there were risks, you know, systems I put into place so that I wouldn't ever have this problem, but this was one of those, like, I got to bite that fear and descend until I touch the ground. <laughs> That was the scariest thought process. Yeah, no, I can totally imagine. And it's not like you had synthetic vision. Not that that would fix it, but at least it helps if you have some of the technology that you have now. It sure would have been nice to have that. I have flown with synthetic vision once, and it was kind of like, man, that would have that would have just made my day. Of course, probably would have not helped in the fact that I didn't think I was going to make an airport at first, but at least I would have seen the pole that I was going to hit. <laughs> but, no, <it> was that, <laughs> uh, you know, I kind of laugh about it now, but that was, you know, it, you know, I didn't have any of that technology. I barely had a Garmin 396 in the airplane with me, so, you know, it was very limited skill set. Um, I used my altimeter to know what the field height was, you know, and says, okay, 50 feet above that, let's drop the gear. You know, and then I was able to flare it and hold it off long enough until it, you know, the, I thought the gear locked and we touched the ground about the same time. Kind of got lucky there. Ooh, you must have breathed a big sigh of relief. The dog even breathed that sigh of relief because he finally sat up. It was the only approach he never watched me actually fly. He actually stayed laying down in his seat. And as soon as we sat up, he kind of gave me those big puppy dog eyes like, are we really on the ground? And I'm just like looking at him with the same big eyes going, I think so. <laughs> Aww. Have you ever flown for uh, for pilots and PAWS or, or any organization like that? I have not yet. I've never really had the aircraft, uh, at, you know, to do most of those. I would have kind of liked to do some of the pilot for Paul's. Running the flight school is not really giving me that freedom to do a lot of those things. Uh, or angel flights, I would be more than thrilled to do some of those if I had mm -hmm. the airplane to do that. Um, that's been, but I have been willing to go with some people. But several, actually, the, the cool part is, is I've actually trained a lot of people who have taken that skill and have gone ahead and done those exact things, Operation Airdrop for the hurricane victims of the, uh, you know, pilots for Pauls, and they actually used our Aztec at the time. So to know that I trained the pilot tours doing some of those is actually still kind of the cool factor, too. Yeah, no, that's got to be rewarding. Do you remember a particularly memorable or favorite flight that you've done while working? Well, there's quite a few. Like I said, currently my Christmas Eve flight right now is <laughs> uh, I had my family on board and we had a an engine failure, surprisingly, and it's the first time I'd had an, uh, an emergency with my family on the board as while well, I was pilot in command, so that was a, an experience. I'm not sure it was a favorite, but the kids thought it was the greatest thing in the world, actually. <laughs> How they're, 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 they're the 20, kids? You know, the youngest is 21, the other one is 23, but at the same time, they're acting like little teenage brats in the back right up until I, you know, tell them we have a problem. But then they're still, like, taking Snapchat videos, and, you know, it's just crazy. It's kind of like I cannot believe that happened in the back, you know. <laughs> you have an emergency in their Snapchat. <laughs> 
Yeah, they're not cutting the emergency, but it, I do get where they were coming from because when I've been in the back seat with, you know, my mom or my dad's emergencies a few times, I really didn't know the problem was existing or I didn't worry about it. Even if I knew the situation was there, uh, I was relaxed about it because as far as I was concerned, they're up front. They got it. that This is going to be nothing. It, it was a no big deal in my mindset, and that's where my kids were, and that is – you have to take that as a compliment to your skill set, and it's a, it is a humbling to know that your family trusts you that much. So you definitely don't want to let them down. <laughs> but my favorite flight, I think, was when I was working. I was flying freight. I actually took my daughter. It was just before school, and she was doing the school clothes shopping, and I took her with me on my freight job, and we went shopping together because I was going to be there for, like, eight hours. So while I'm sitting on the ground, technically off-duty, we went shopping together as mother and daughter. And then we flew together, of course, as mother and daughter, and this one, is she actually became an instructor a few years later. I see you answered my question before I, I even asked. I was going to ask if your kids fly and, and what their relationship to aviation is. So she's a CFI. Uh, my she, my oldest daughter became a CFI, double I, and an MEI also. She didn't send it, didn't work on her AMP, but she had an interest in it. She just never focused on it. She's gone back to school. She's working on becoming an accountant, a CPA down the road, um, and she's really enjoying that. So she's not really actively in aviation, even though she works for the people who she taught to fly, uh, and they are, they still do some flying. She still comes and we fly together, or she'll borrow an airplane and take off with her friends, you know, for the day or something. But so she's not active in the aviation side as much as she once was. The other two children, which were in the back seat, they did, I, we had soloed both of them, um, but they never quite finished. One, my youngest one went into the Marines, so he never finished his ratings. And the other, she decided it really wasn't for her, so she, she went off to become something else. It's not for everybody. And it's cool that you give them the the freedom to choose whatever. You're not trying to push them into something. Yeah, well, I could be accused of pushing them. I really wanted them to at least finish the rating, you know, just to say they have it. Um, right. But at the same time, yeah, at some point you have to just walk away and know they're not going to do it. Uh, you know, so, you know, up until, you know, I knew they wasn't winning, but, hey, you know, I'm a mom. I'm going to try at least, you know, because I thought it might be the best for them. I did see that with my daughter when she was looking at nursing school. Um, her grades were good grades, but they weren't outstanding. She she didn't have that outstanding record where every college wanted her. But the one nursing college, when they heard she had been tr flight training uh, towards being a pilot, they actually got more interested in her in coming to their college. Just You know, they kind of had to beat them off. I'm like, we're not really interested in your school. But that was one of those where they tick marked the box and said, we want this one. She's different. Um, she, you know, so she went to, you know, she got out of nursing, but uh, the school, uh, she's a professional nanny right now. So, but she uses her nursing information. So she likes kids and, and she likes being involved in health. So that's useful. That's very useful. I'm sure that gives people peace of mind when they leave their kids with her. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, she has to keep up with all certifications anyway. You know, and I would say, the, you know, learning a little bit about flying probably has influenced her ability to kind of plan for things and, you know, and consider all alternatives, you know, something of being a pilot. We always have to consider our way out, what's our backup plan, you know, what's the alternates. Well, she's pretty good at that, actually. So maybe, be, you know, the, all that flight training we did give her said something in there. So I like to think so anyway. She might say differently. <laughs> well, I, I, I bet it does. Plus, it definitely teaches you to multitask. I do a lot of things that require multitasking, but flying a plane is on another level <laughs> when it comes to that. Right. And, it, you know, it, it is once you develop the flow of the multitask items, then the, the multitasking comes easier. I look forward to that moment. <laughs> it will happen. So let me ask you about this uh, Girls in Flight Training organization that you have. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Girls in Flight Training uh, Gift Academy, as we call it, is uh, a program that my mom uh, originally started looking at. We were all kind of looking at it. Uh, a lady had put out an, uh, a kind of a study, an article about 
you know, how the women were, we were the highest ratios of washing out. You know, we could start out at the same amount of men, but only 70% of the men, you know, washed out or quit training, whereas 90% or it was higher, actually, I think a number, more than 90% of the women were, you know, quitting their flight training. So the question came up as to why were they quitting? So we, you know, it's like, who's going to do that? Who's going to look at that? And my mom decided to look in the mirror and said, that's got to be her. And then she roped me into it with her and my dad, and we kind of held our very first event. And it was trying to find out really why were they not finishing? Why were women? So we, we went out to try to attract those women. We didn't have a clue what we were getting ourselves into or what we were doing, really. And then it just kind of started exploding. It's like, let's do it again. Now we realize where we were we took it slightly. It's taken a diversion, so it's not the original flight plan we had, but it's still we're still gathering that information. What's preventing some of these women from continuing on? Money and time. Everybody has that. I don't care what your gender is, what your race is. We all have that struggle. Um, it, it is what it is. You know, we all have that struggle. You know, as well. But when we start dealing with the impersonal parts of it, how the how the instructors relate to us and how they talk to us and how they treat us in our ground school, there's where we start to see differences occur sometimes. Not always, but there are still a, quite a bit of the societal, you know, rules that are creeping in, even though it's subtle or we don't even realize we're doing it ourselves. You know, we, we do it for ourselves sometimes without looking at it. Um, it's often assumed that the boys automatically know engines and girls won't. And I can tell you right now, a lot of these young adults, males and females I got in here, they don't know anything more about what a carburetor is, if they even know what that word is, than, you know, anybody else. <laughs> so, right. you know, if you don't, if you haven't been taught that, you don't know. It doesn't matter what your gender is, you know, and I'm seeing that and it's starting to come out, you know, but then there's the, the outside support network. People tend to not keep the male from learning to fly, except maybe moms or wives who are scared for their children or they don't want to raise children alone because, it, you know, air, flying airplanes is dangerous and scary. Uh, again, it's a, a, a myth and a perception that we're trying to constantly battle, whereas they tend to steer women in the wrong direction, and that's, again, where we're looking at it. We're marketing to mom. We're taking the mom. There's a lot of programs introducing women to aviation. GIFT was based on how do we get them past whatever's causing the block and get them through that point, you know, if it's fears. You know, nobody makes fun of the fears. We do not make fun of the fears. They're very legit fears, and we're going to coach you through them, whatever method works best for you, not to suck it up, you know, and, and deal with it or get out. That's, that's not really good for either gender. <laughs> Women do sometimes think differently, not, you know, men do it too, but some women tend to look at the big picture and we freeze because we can't figure out how to break it down in steps. That's the job of the instructor. Men are, tend to be very linear in their thinking, so they see the steps, but they don't always see the broad picture. we got to teach it both ways. we got to say, hey, here's the big picture, what you're trying to do. Let's go back to break it down. So the lesson really works for either side, but sometimes the women need to, need someone who will stop and say, look, here's the picture. Now, here's step one. Here's the first puzzle, the first piece of the puzzle. Now let's go to number puzzle number two. And then it goes from there. Right. No, I get it. Especially uh, when you're not a child and you have a lot of responsibilities already, it's easy to lose focus of the big picture for sure. Life gets in the way of everybody's flight training. You know, life gets in everybody's way, whether it's, you know, family, job, you know, variety of things. The one thing about GIFT was the networking that we see and that becomes the, you know, the core of our group. So each of our class, we call them our graduating classes when we have these week-long events. And it's literally just these women that may be anywhere from a dozen ladies to 30 ladies. One year we had 50. That was a little much. We were not prepared. That's a lot. But, it, but they all worked together. And at some point, you know, they it was the big support. They were like, oh, my God, you, you know that same feeling. And they started realizing they weren't the only ladies, even though – Two people would be making, becoming best friends that you wouldn't see becoming friends. You know, this 
20 year old becoming best friends with a 64 year old and they, you know, stayed in communication for ages. And you're like, how did they become best friends? You know, because you think they're <laughs> on two spectrums, but they found their mutual, you know, spot. Uh, some of the others where I knew they were on opposite parts of the, the country and they met in Vernon, became good friends, you know, and then years later, one moves and then now they're close together again, but they always stayed in contact and like, being a gift, you know, uh, kind of the gift group, we kind of see the dynamics stay there or don't stay there. So I get to see them on the social media or they'll let us know or they even come back and assist us with another class. They want to come teach. They want to pay it forward. They want, you know, they want to, they want to continue the networking. As you see the Facebook groups we've done, uh, the Instagram, it's really cool because we kind of, we created our little club finally. We, we got our social network that we didn't have before really gifts, in, in my opinion. I never had that when I was flight training or even as a mechanic, especially. And now it's starting to really happen. You know, it's, it's taking off in ways you never would have imagined. Well, and that mentorship and that mutual support, that co- that feeling of community and support is really priceless. I really value the support and the community and and having an organization that creates that is is amazing and it's commendable. I'm glad you're out there doing that because I feel vulnerable and susceptible to wanting to give up. It's just I'm way too stubborn to ever do that. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, and, and it was a nice thing and it took us a while to, you know, to catch on to realize it really was the networking and having that environment where you didn't feel out of place. It's probably the hardest thing to sometimes be the only girl in the room. You know, who can you ask these questions for, you know, of? And, you, you know, you don't want to ask the questions now because somebody's over there, you know, snickering when you do sometimes. But sometimes they're grateful to you because you're the only one who's willing to stick out and stick your neck out and ask those questions. So it goes both ways, but it sometimes it is nice just to go – sit in a room with, and learn the same things with a bunch of other ladies. And, some, you know, we get that outside of the gift weeks that we do at Vernon. Sometimes we'll be having three or four or even six people there training, and, and they're all women. So you can imagine when some poor pilot wanders into this conference room thinking he's getting a private room and he just sees a whole bunch of ladies sitting around a table, clearly ADA stuff. He just sometimes turns around and walks back out thinking he's walked into the wrong building. <laughs> You know, because they don't know what to do with that. They've never seen it before, you know. And other times, you know, they're like, oh, wow, never seen this many women. And so, you know, they, you know, it, 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 it's just usually a kind of more of a shock and awe moment, you know. And usually we'll end up taking them out to the suppers. You can imagine sitting down, you know, taking six people to a, to a lunch, you know, whatever pilots were in the terminal building and, the majority is women. That's something that doesn't happen, you know, even though my dad's always included in most of these. So he's the one token male. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did teach you to fly, so he gets privileges. Right. Well, he can teach all these women to fly. I mean, he's been at it for more than 50 years since he learned to fly. And he's got a way with teaching anybody, basically. There's probably been a few he's told to go away, but... There's, you know, I can't even imagine how many, how many pilots are out there that he's influenced and affected, and especially the women. He is, you know, the women, you know, it doesn't matter to him, it's gender. You know, he does want to see the women succeed, though, and he was my biggest supporter. Whereas we started it because of my daughter, my oldest daughter, she had soloed. She soloed five airplanes on her, on her birthday. You know, which was unusual, but we had access to the plane. She'd been training for an entire year, so it wasn't like she was, you know, five hours into solo. No, she already had probably 100 hours at 16. But um, we went to the Sweetwater Museum where the at Venger Field where, to meet the Watts because they were having their homecoming almost two weeks after, two or three weeks after her birthday. And we met the first woman D1 pilot, and Crystal was her name. And we introduced her to my daughter, and we were saying, and, you know, we were more impressed with Crystal, obviously. She flies that big B-1 bomber, but she she was more impressed with my daughter, who had soloed five airplanes. She, because this woman, this child had what she didn't have was that support worker. 
Her family wouldn't let her go anywhere near an airplane, so she joined the Air Force at 18 and kind of got lucky and got into the flying side. <laughs> you know, so wow. she would actually bring her her daughter, and after that we said, would this work? Would it happen? And so, you know, in a sense, that was, you know, it was understanding these women, you know, they weren't feeling supported one way or another. Um, and so that's where it's all come down to. And even me, I would say, yeah, there were things that I did that my family didn't support me on. You know, and it was the hardest thing to overcome to still do some of that. But, you know, at the same time, I can relate to that now with my people. It's like, I understand you're not supported. I am now your supporter. I am, I call myself CFI mom. My students all call me mom sometimes because they're like my kids. <laughs> you know, I kick them out of the nest a lot, but they're like, you know, at the same time, I'm in their face when I catch them, you know, making mistakes that are going to hurt somebody if they don't do something. They usually know it, but I'm like, uh-huh, did you learn anything from that mistake? Like a mom. <laughs> <laughs> and give them that look. <laughs> they go fly right. I like it. I like it. And your daughter, that is impressive. Of course, the other pilot thought that was so cool. I mean, it is. And, and yeah, people like me, I didn't grow up with anyone in aviation. Uh, it is pretty extra fun when we hear stories from people like you who grew up with, with all of that. What about your mom? Is she still around? Oh, yeah. My mom and my dad are both still very active. We still run gift. Um, the, you know, still teach. We, you know, we had a gift back in October and, uh, we had, we were going to have one in Sheboygan, Wisconsin in June. I had to look up the dates. They'll be on our website. And then, yeah, like I said, they still fly the corporate. They still, you know, my mom was an examiner for a while. She's thinking about getting, you know, looking into getting it back. She still teaches. Uh, here all the time, does other things, the 99, the, the women in aviation, we go to a lot of these conferences. Uh, we do, you know, so yeah, we're still extremely active in the business. So they're still in Vernon and I'm over here in the Metroplex. So, you know, so yeah, we're, <laughs> she's just the same as almost. <laughs> Very cool. And then you guys have the events in different places. It's not just at your home airport. The October one is always in Vernon. Um, and I, and I'm usually work that with her and my, you know, and my dad, we're with the primary ones. We get some volunteer instructors. Um, I have done a couple here in the Metroplex one, uh, in the summer, near the summertime at the beginning of summer. It's a little harder in the summertime, but sometimes we're more focused on the ground school and the networking than a whole lot of the flying though, because it's so cheap. Everybody wants to fly as much as they can too, but we do use that to, they're feeling like they're not progressing at their school or there's problems, we fly with them to find out what maybe is the problem and then see if we can, what we can do to overcome it. Maybe within the gift week, sometimes they have to come back to us or they will go home and say, you know what, fire that instructor, I want a different one. Uh, they learn a lot in that one week. Part of it's because you have no distractions. You know, you're not, you're not at home. You know, somebody else is doing all that stuff. You're not worried about it. It's literally eight hours a day of nothing but flying and talking about aviation. So, you know, you're not worried about who's cooking supper and who's going to go get groceries and who's picking up the kiddos or any of that. Right. No, totally. And and if someone wanted to, do you have specific ages or can anybody be a part of it? And if somebody does want to come to one of your gift weeks, then what? Uh, what? Where would they find you? Okay. They, we we do say they need to be 18 years old and up. Um, just because, you know, we're, we don't really want to take on dealing with the minors. Now, it, uh, someone younger than 18 might be approved to come along if they're coming with their mother, aunt, or whatever legal guardian, or even if their dad was an instructor and wanted to volunteer, we would probably consider it depending on the situation. Uh, so, we, you know, but generally, the a younger than 16 is probably not showing up much, though a few have brought their babies or toddlers for a day or so while they could nurse them and stuff and sit in ground school for parts of part of the time. So that was kind of fun because they'll pay past the baby around with, you know, a dozen ladies. You're never without a babysitter. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sometimes it worked out, you know, but uh, a lot of times it's like, can I have my baby back? <laughs> um, but, you know, the, oh, good grief, where was I going with some of that? Uh, but we don't, you know, we're starting to try to expand it where we get other areas maybe to host a similar week in their local area. And it just really 
you know, kind of fires up maybe some of your local people, a local school that wants to do this because I can tell you one thing, what it did for my flight school, I had one airplane, did a couple of gifts a couple of times, and next thing I know, I was so exploded with students because those ladies were either, they wouldn't leave at the end of the week. They want to stay longer because they, they, they realized what they were gaining. It's like, I can stay longer. Can I stay longer? Or they wanted to come back. To come, you know, it's like, hey, I can take two weeks. Can I come back and see what we can get done in two weeks? Okay. You know, and then they would just come more for that private training as opposed to a group training. But they were make, they wanted to continue that progress. They didn't want to drop it. And at the same time, they, these same ladies, marketing to mom, as we would call it, is this mom is now encouraging her kids or her neighbor's kids, oh, you're seeking flight training, you're interested, you need to go to these people. So they were sending, you know, my, you know, the ladies I meet, they were calling, say, they, their friends are like, hey, well, you live right there in the DFW area, you need to go see Tamara, you need to go see Fox Aviation because she was great at gift. And believe me, I, you know, would have never said that, but it's like I couldn't run the business off. They need they quadrupled our business, not doubled wow. it. Because, well, there's 50% of the business. No, but they kept bringing everybody. So, yeah, I only have a third of my clients are women compared to the 100%. You know, you look at it, and it's still kind of low numbers, but it's still a very high ratio than what's out there. But it was because of that reputation. And women tend to be, they like, you know, if they like the reviews and they like what they've experienced, they're going to tell the world. We're very vocal. Yes, I can you know, attest to that for sure. <laughs> you know, we're very vocal about what we like as well as what we dislike, whereas, you know, but we may not want to hurt anybody's feelings, so we don't necessarily say what we don't like. Men, on the other hand, tend to not really talk about how great something is, but they will tell you what they absolutely hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? That's true. I think we're socialized. I mean, Differently. <laughs> Probably because you're you're in Texas and there's like the whole Southern hospitality thing. And then for me being from Puerto Rico, there is a certain element of the culture where you're just socialized to put other people in front of you and and make them more important and take care of them first and not ruffle any feathers. But we're kind of tasked with being that manner as men were not necessarily. So women are coming out of our shell. It was the same thing. The culture is actually just as common here in the U.S. as it was in Puerto Rico. I think it's, it's probably the shell has come down a lot sooner in the U.S. than maybe some of, the, some of these other countries or places. But that it's slowly changing. Uh, I've never visited Puerto Rico, but actually a few of my students were Puerto Rican. So there's that. <laughs> but, you know, I did travel the world. I actually flew overseas and stuff and lived in these other countries uh, even. And I did see the culture differences, and I saw how it was. So it really opened my eyes on how good we actually have it and how far we got to go. <laughs> where, where did you live abroad? Uh, I lived in Germany for about two and a half years. I was flying. I was corporate pilot then. Uh, it was not – it was a civilian job. It was a U.S. registered airplane, even though it was a German-owned company. And so me and my family, we packed up, and I went to go live a dream for a short while. <laughs> that sounds awesome. You're actually the third person on this podcast who was born in Germany. <laughs> I lived there. I've flown around the world. I've actually flown both oceans, uh, you know, been to a couple of oddball countries I would have never expected to go to and enjoyed some of them. Uh, and then I have done some contract flying, like in Mexico. Well, I was only there for three months, you know, but the differences in how I was treated in Mexico and how I was treated in Germany or how I was treated in Turkey and stuff was just so vastly different in all these places. Uh, you know, it made me appreciate how rare I really was out there. Did you feel supported in these places, or was there any time where you felt discriminated against? Uh, I would say there was a definite discrimination situation, or, you know, in Mexico, you know, because um, the captain there both tried to, you know, hit on me as well as he would introduce me in Spanish, which I didn't know Spanish uh, at the time, that hey, this is my girlfriend, because over there, it really still is kind of the culture that they really expect these co-pilots, these female co-pilots, to sleep with them. 
you know, for the permission of flying with them. And I'm just like, no, this is not how this works. But, and it's, you know, and I've met a few of the ladies that have come to the U.S. and they're like, yes, that's really happening. And I'm like, oh my God, you poor, you know, mm-hmm. just want to go cuddle them all up and no, you're, you know, this is not happening. It, but it's kind of a culture that's slowly maybe fading away, but it's going to take some time. Italy wasn't quite that bad, but there was still this, like, no, you're a flight attendant. No, I'm a pilot. Here's my pilot's license. No, you're a flight attendant. I need to see the crew button. You know? So, yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun picture. My captain actually enjoyed the show because we got the, the local police in the airport involved and he had to, he had to tell the, the gatekeeper basically is like, no, she can walk up to her place. She's the pilot. <laughs> uh, Turkey, I was kind of, it, I didn't really get any problems in Dubai or Turkey uh, being female, but there was sometimes there was a double standard in the sense that, okay, the guy had to take his belt, and, you know, off and, you know, his jacket off and things, whereas the female, they didn't ask him to do the same thing, you know, which was kind of funny. <laughs> So, you know, I, you know, but it, it was just different, it, but they really didn't treat me that differently. I walked in, I was introduced to the pilot, and I was handled as a pilot. So some places they were very professional about it. Sometimes some places were not so professional about it. Right. I'm surprised that they were more respectful yeah. of you as a female pilot in Dubai. <laughs> I do, you know, I was. No, Dubai is very, very tourist-minded. Uh, They're very, uh, my, you know, in a sense, Western-minded, you know, a little more broad-minded. It was a – we call ourselves the melting pot here in the U.S., but I will say I didn't understand that, you know, what that really looked like in the same sense until I was in the shopping mall in Dubai, the, this giant shopping mall that has a ski hall and everything in it. it but – to walk into like this lingerie shop and it's everything from a, a person standing in there in typical American Western wear like me, guys are in there with their ladies, but these ladies are in, you know, maybe with just the small hijab on their head, little small head covering, but still looks like Western wear to the full burqa, you know, and it was just, it was just kind of that culture shock for me to look at it, you know, and, oh, wow in the full burqa because we see it on TV as, you know, kind of like this horrible thing. And it's like, no, but they have to wear something under there. So I guess they're in the same store I am. Uh, so, but it was, just a, it was a, an awakening, you know, a broadening of my horizons and what, you know, hey, we're all kinds of women and, and men, you know, and we are truly a unusual melting pot. They're very conservative over in Dubai. And there's a lot of rules I couldn't have got away with you can get away with here in the U.S. But, well, my yeah. husband spent time there, and he says that their favorite thing to say is not allowed. Well, that's true. But, I, you know, once you kind of, you know, I was, and I was traveling into all these countries, you know, I would try to learn a little bit. It's like, okay, what can I get away with here? Can I, can I leave the airport? Do I need a head covering? Uh, you know, not, do I need, you know, I, I worried about that in a few places where I knew it's kind of like, okay, could this be a problem, not a problem? Um, luckily, it never was really an issue. We didn't go into any of those places. Pakistan was closest I got to that, but we never left the airport either. So <laughs> I saw it was a beautiful water and everything around Pakistan, but we didn't leave. <laughs> so I didn't have to deal with that. Oh, very, very interesting. I, I spent a lot of – I was offered a gig as a – because my, my main work is as a singer and a DJ, and I used to sing in five-star hotels in Asia. So I spent a lot of time in – all sorts of different parts of Asia. And when I'd go, my contracts would be three to six months at a time. So I'd get to know the place, you know, a little bit more than if I was there for a week or a few days, which is great. Um, And I did get offered once a an event in Dubai, but it was like for a couple of nights. And at the same time, I got offered three months in Seoul in South Korea. So I preferred to have more steady work than to go in and I missed that opportunity but who knows maybe one day yeah, I was only in Dubai for a week so but the, you know it was just enough to get a good taste of it uh there were things I would have liked to have seen I sometimes like to get away from the tourist side of things I'll tell you I did like South Korea too uh I was there as a mechanic for about six months not quite six months so that was kind of cool <laughs> 
Oh, that's very cool. Uh, do you remember any particularly memorable story in South Korea? <laughs> Uh, well, most of mine took place on the airport, the Anjan Ri Camp Humphrey. Uh, we would go over to Osan, uh, base, but I actually went into Seoul and I think the, it was kind of fun going into Seoul. I loved going to the, all the markets. I didn't care, you know, I loved how they had all the little open markets and the bargaining. I never understood bargaining, but I learned in Korea how to do this bargaining. You know, you offer price, they say, say, no, this price, and you go back and forth to you agree. It was kind of fun, it, but I love, I tried I tried to figure out how the locals did it, and I kind of wanted to be a part of the locals, if that made sense. Uh, I didn't want to be always the American. Um, so I would go buy my food in the markets and stuff. The shocking was, you know, in one of the small markets where, you know, we walked past with the guys, and we saw the little doggy outside the little butcher shop, and you come back a little later, well, doggy's not there. Oh <laughs> uh, God! It was it was a you know it was kind of like I knew that existed, but it was you know I probably contained it a little better than a couple of people did. Uh, you know, because you know a little bit of that was it's one thing to know it's another thing to recognize it and see it full fledged. Like oh, yep, <laughs> not shopping at this particular butcher shop today. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, well I'm vegan, so that. <laughs> At least there's yeah. that. <laughs> didn't do, it didn't occur me on that department, but it was one of those, you know, I didn't turn down a lot of things. I, I you know, recognized a few things. It's like, okay, so I'm out here in the little boonies of Korea. Yeah, they're still doing this occasionally, people. Uh, not as much. And that was, that's been good grief. That's been almost 20, 25 years ago. So this is a long time ago, actually. Um, I was, right. you know, yeah in that time frame. Uh, going into Seoul was kind of cool, you know, because I'm riding the train. I can't read a thing on any of the trains going out of Anjanri, you know, into Seoul because they don't see that many Americans traveling like that. So it was kind of like trying to figure out where you're going in a language you have no clues. <laughs> and then, of course, went into a Burger King. My favorite thing was to a Burger King. It's like, I can't read the menu. But they had this picture menu <laughs> on the counter and or the, it was KFC or Burger King, I can't remember. And I remember pointing, we pointed to the pictures, me and my companion at the time, we were pointing to the pictures of what we want to order. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they had that option for you, definitely, because otherwise you would have had no idea what was coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know. But I could point, it was like an ad, you know, like we do all the time, you know, hey, this is the burger we have on sale or the chicken, you know, so that's what I was thinking at, you know, at the time. So it was kind of funny, you know. <laughs> we got what we wanted and we enjoyed it, you know, but it was different to try to communicate sometimes. Yeah, definitely. I, I had a pilot on the show who learned to fly in a military base in Japan. So she was flying under FAA rules, but flying over Mount Fuji, you know. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I didn't get to do any flying while I was in Korea. Uh, disappointed in that one, but it was that it would have been a really cool. So I'm jealous of her. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most beautiful uh, flight that you that you ever remember anywhere in the world? Oh, there was a couple of them. I mean. I love flying over the Alps in, in Europe. That was to me just phenomenally beautiful. Um, and then flying into Pakistan and Turkey, the water was so, so blue. It blew my mind. It, you know, it, it was just bluer than I had seen ocean water. So that really boggled my mind. Um, and then where were we? It was the, I guess I wouldn't have called it beautiful, but it stood out as to, you know, how unique my experience was going to be with landing into the, the one of the atolls, uh, I can't think of the name, where we were, out in the Pacific, little bitty island. It, it was, uh, I don't have to look up the name now, I cannot, I'm drawing a blank on one of these little atolls, and it's this little runway, and the water was actually lapping up on the runway, the rocks. That was, you know, it was kind of mind-boggling. I thought, like, the whole island's only five miles wide. Was it Singapore? Singapore? No, no. It was, uh, it was bef before Hawaii. It was uh, outside of Guam. We stopped in Guam, and it was along the atoll. And, uh, and at the moment, I am drawing a blank on the name of the little island that we went to. 
We stayed there for a couple of days, and then we moved on. Um, so it was in the Pacific. So it was, we were flying from Hong Kong over. Hong Kong was very pretty to see, uh, but I, but it was almost too foggy to really see it clearly. And Iceland was another one of my favorites. I, I don't know what it was about Iceland to see the difference between the volcanic rock and then the snow-covered days. To me, that just blew my mind. But, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was from Texas. We don't see snow and ice very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Puerto Ricans don't either. I, I, I've skied once in my life. So. <laughs> I've heard incredible things about Iceland and about flying there as well. So I feel you. you I, I feel like you have so much uh, experience that I wouldn't even know how to get to some of your experiences with regular questions. So I'm glad that you're sharing this with me. Is there any particular experience and or advice that you would want to leave the listeners with? I've learned don't be afraid of mistakes. You know, we, we, we can't be afraid of being seen, you know, making mistakes, you know, or making our judgments. We stand by what we learn because if you're not making some mistakes, then you're obviously not learning something. Now, if you keep making the same mistake, you're not learning something, obviously. But uh, we, if we're going to make mistakes in our, you know, I, I may, you know, I would have said some of my flights going into, you know, applying corporate or even taking certain jobs, they were mistakes. But I learned something from those. I learned where I didn't want to work again. I flew with the wrong instructors or flew with the wrong captain. Well, I learned not to do that again. So we do learn from our mistakes. Don't be afraid of them. Just know when to get out. That is very good advice because especially for women, I think that's part of how we're socialized. Don't make a mistake. Keep it all looking perfect. There's some of that, I would agree. And I think sometimes we internalize when the mistake is not necessarily us. Uh, you know, in the sense that, well, I just chose the, the wrong instructor, but don't say that it's your fault. It's actually, no, you are the bad instructor for me. We're done, and you got to be willing to walk away. And I think sometimes women walk away thinking it's on them when it's actually the other way around, whereas men, on the general side, sometimes they're like, I'm just going to push through this. Not always true. I have a lot of men who would be the opposite of that, so maybe it's more of a cultural thing or something society has pressed upon us than it was a gender specific. Uh, what I might have thought was gender specific as I've aged and trained people, my attitudes on some of that has changed. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's that's insightful, and it's a useful insight for me, for sure. So hopefully it'll be useful for some of the listeners as well. I just wanted to thank you for your time and thank you for generously sharing all of this insight and all of this experience and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it also. And that concludes the conversation that I got to have with Tamara Griffith of Girls in Flight Training Academy. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here at Chicks Who Fly. We really enjoy doing this podcast for you. If you are enjoying this podcast, please consider following us on Spotify and subscribing on YouTube, as well as sharing with all your friends who might enjoy this podcast as well. Also, if you would like to be more intimately involved with the creation of this podcast, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon at Chicks Who Fly. You can reach us at chickswhoflyofficial at gmail.com and on our website, chickswhofly.com. Thank you so much once again, and we look forward to spending some more time with you on the next episode of Chicks Who Fly.